complicated it can be to make the machine learn and reapply the, the procedures of problem solving. Now, there are authors uh, who uh, see uh, the agents as uh, self-interested. Uh, I do not uh, understand that into uh, the necessary uh, detail, but uh, uh, for my point, uh, the important thing is that um, mm, the self-interested agent, uh, in order to uh, optimize the strategy to to minimize the necessary energy for reaching their goal, their preferred states, uh, uh, display uh, what is called Hebbian learning. That is, they self, they rebuild themselves, they, they uh, reorganize themselves, uh, their internal connections and their interconnections with other agents, uh, so that the network is actually as a collective. Uh, capable of displaying uh, an analogy of uh, associative memory in humans. So uh, why is this interesting for me? Uh, I uh, see this as a, as a great evidence of uh, the fact that memory can mean a very different thing than we are used to to imagine, uh, to imagine when we uh, conceive of remembering people. Here, the agents are capable of remembering due to their integration in systems, in collectives, so to speak. A memory is something that is not stored somewhere in the first place, but performed by the agent. And also, uh, the memory is not uh, physically built, it's not of, of a physical nature although it depends in a, in, a, in a complex way on a lot of physical conditions and backgrounds. But memory is something that emerges from, from the network of, uh, of inter-connecting uh, agents. So how is this, how is this in, interesting for philosophy? I think uh, this, could, uh, this could help us uh, old-fashioned and uh, rather slow-minded philosophers to avoid the traditional troublemaking metaphysical questions about memory, such as where is memory and uh, what does the memory physically consist of? In what form is memory stored? Or in virtue of which is the store content identical uh, with the original uh, memorized event or situation? Uh, so, because from a from, uh, shifted point of view, these questions uh, can prove to be uh, uninteresting, uh, simplifying, perhaps misleading. Uh, because we can, uh, from another point of view, see memory as, uh, as an agent's skill to display what she or he or it learned, uh, as, I, as I wanted to, to uh, present that in the practice of uh, multi-agent networks, memory is something that is performed by, a, by an agent within a network. That is to say, memory is a collective matter, and memory is, no, is not stored inside, stored physically inside the agent, uh, is not of a causal, uh, but of a performative and, and associative nature. Uh, so, philosophy could use uh, the multi-agent system parallel to get rid of the old-fashioned mentalistic metaphysics of storage memory, and instead to account for memory in a more dynamic uh, and uh, practice-oriented terms uh, uh, as a heterogeneous skill that is linked to a rich external conceptual pragmatic whatever context and is performed by a member of a collective. Uh, I think that uh, uh, there are there is more than one way how to implement uh, this uh, parallel into a philosophical consideration. We can either stress the Hebbian vein, that is to say we can, we can uh, see memory still as something that is stored within or in the form of uh, the reorganized structures or connections of the agent's organism or brain. Uh, that is to say, we can uh, we can repair uh, the old naive theory uh, into into a form that uh, that is more uh, 
considerate of of the contemporary scientific uh, discoveries. Uh, this is uh, this is a line of reasoning that is followed by some respectable philosophers, such as Hubert Dreyfus, for example. Uh, for me, uh, I think more interesting could be to uh, to use this uh, this uh, example from uh, from the, the artificial memory uh, context to avoid uh, any search for any cause or background uh, of memory that we could uh, focus instead on how uh, the agents we know as memory and doubt, how they act. Uh, we can focus on how we conceive of them and how we speak of them. Uh, that is to say to focus on the agent, uh, his or her its uh, bodily performance in real time and uh, sees the quest for uh, the memory that should, that should consist of uh, body parts or body structures. Now, uh, ironically, uh, this uh, line of uh, reasoning about memory uh, is today a rather historical thing because uh, there are very uh, prominent philosophical names in this line of reasoning such as Maurice Merleau-Ponty or uh, Ludwig Wittgenstein, but all those are philosophers uh, from the historical times uh, before the outburst of cognitive science. Uh, so uh, if, I, uh, uh, if I express my sympathy for, for this line of, uh, of count for memory, it can be uh, an expression of philosophical sentimentality, uh, I'm afraid. Anyway, uh, the final question, what does it mean that I remember seeing an elephant yesterday can be answered in different ways. One possible answer is that an image of elephant is stored within my, within my mind and in a connection, of, uh, in a connection with an image of yesterday, uh, which is, I think, more or less wrong answer. But we can also say that uh, there is a uh, there is a connection structure within my brain that uh, enables me to remember such a thing that I saw an elephant yesterday. That's, that's the Dreyfusian way, uh, which is uh, I think more or less right answer, but not exactly that that interesting. Uh, I'm afraid uh, because we can also uh, adopt another viewpoint uh, to focus on. Uh, uh, what can I do uh, as a someone who remembers seeing an elephant yesterday? Uh, what either I or or uh, someone else uh, can uh, can infer from from this memory of mine? Uh, uh, what does it mean uh, for me or for other people with whom I I'm in interaction that I remember something? Uh, so that we can shift uh, the emphasis uh, from the memory uh, as something that uh, goes on uh, uh, in our brains uh, to memory uh, as something that goes on in our lives, uh, which can both be true, but I think which uh, I think both is not equally uh, interesting for philosophy, in my point of view. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andre. And as before, we have some time for a short question. Yes. So, what about the David Chalmers and the extended mind hypothesis? It sounds like your account for memory works really well with that. We can distribute memory out of the environment. We might even have it in other minds uh, as long as we can access, to, access it and use it. Uh, actually, I'm not familiar with the with the David Chalmers work, so so I I can't uh, be part of the discussion. So, uh, but I think the more we we 
we are able to externalize our our Google memory to better for us. Hi, so I love this, and maybe I'm too fond of ants and insects, but I was surprised you didn't mention them. Because there's even a word, I don't know how to it, I don't know if anyone knows it, but it's, it's the way uh, uh, insect specialists refer to how ants communicate through living traces in their environment. Yeah. Even Wikipedia could be thought as that. You know, instead of uh, editors communicating with Wikipedia, they communicate with this article. But I, I'm just curious, why did you mention insects? You didn't like them? Uh, <laughs> just, it just didn't come up to my mind. <laughs> uh, my mistake, because my wife is a biologist, so uh, she should have uh, mentioned this. <laughs> but we are right that uh, living creatures like uh, ants uh, are more natural parallels for or implementing the uh, agents uh, using using our memory. I will consider it in some further break <laughs> in my first section. As long as we're talking about polio, uh, sort of distributed uh, forms of memory in, in multi agent systems, I wonder if you had a look at uh, Marvin Minsky's uh, K line theory of memory in the society of mind model. <laughs> <Not familiar>. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. I, I'll write it down. <laughs> I would like to ask uh, Chris and Abel to take place here so you could come here. Also, Andre, Clay. So I'm going to make my comments um, right at the beginning, so I'll give you a chance to have a think about um, your response. Um, so Grace, um, you're talking, I'm just going to uh, summarize what you're talking about, just to, to remind people. So you're talking about um, uh, taking legal, or kind of considering the legal implications of, of, of AGI and the, the rights of um, artificial intelligences. And um, I'm just kind of thinking, just, just a bit more broadly, um, you know, I wonder if, if we're, you were kind of saying, you know, we're, we're protecting ourselves against something that's happening in the future, but aren't we already there yet? I mean, and not only, it's not just AGI, isn't it? It's humanity is not only under pressure from machines, but many other factors, environmental change, lots of technologies. I mean, it's not just in intelligence. I just move on to the next question, but essentially that, you know, aren't we there yet? So therefore, you know, what, what, what are our first steps? What do we do? Um, you know, we keep being told about, know about the whole singularity thing you know something's gonna happen in the future we better prepare for it now but aren't we already in the future um, so just uh, just be very interested to hear what you say about that um, Abir, um, I, I guess you know, this, this is not my field of expertise um, but I guess um, one of the things I want to just um, uh, reflect on is that by reducing complexity and trying to kind of eliminate things within within systems of observation or data, are we at risk of oversimplifying and getting rid of things like you know resilience, robustness, um, you know the, the kind of uh, I guess a, a kind of redundancy within um, um, modes of practice that actually allow us to deal with unexpected events. Uh, maybe it's very specific to, to your particular model. Maybe you know the model that you're dealing with is just for a very you know, particular uh, uh, kind of context. Um, but I'm just kind of thinking more broadly about uh, you know the way that we look to simplification and um, abstraction as a way of uh, you know improving the, the performance of things. Um, and Andre, I just yeah um, Okay, so if memory is processed, in practice, what does this change? I know you're kind of coming from a philosophical um, perspective, but if memory is processed, then, then how, how does that change anything? Right, so if you could <laughs> I'll hand over the answer the question. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Okay, um, in regards to your, your question, um, very important and interesting question, and my answer to that is yes and no. Um, 
we are in the future in respect of we speak about in regards to direct challenges to uh, the human in regards to like, climate change and um, I, I would say that's more of a, a, a literal and um, perhaps physical um, ramification whereas what I was trying to illustrate through the what the science fiction is articulating is that in the future if we've got AGI which would be um, the only thing really to challenge our humanness in regards to um, com uh, a comparative entity. And that's something slightly different. And it's something that challenges us not necessarily on a physical level, but on a, um, but in, in regards to sort of how we define ourselves, how we articulate ourselves, how, our position in the, in the universe in regards to um, our, our standing and our hierarchy. So, um, Yes, we are challenged, and we are challenged, um, I think, far more in the 20th and 21st century than we ever had before. Um, through art, uh, well, I, I hesitate to say artificiality, but through stru certain structures it put into place. But I think if the singularity things are correct, then AGI um, does manifest, then it will be perhaps um, challenged on a, on a very different level and a more um, sort of metaphysical, if that makes sense. Yeah, if I can, re can I can respond to that in a second? Yeah, I'm, I'm just thinking, you know, of, of the recent computer virus on the ISS and the, um, you know, the viruses that are bringing down sections of Wall Street and uh, kind of wrecking our economy with, you know, uh, you know, millions of pounds because of um, lost man hour and, uh, you know, com computer equipment. And it just it just seems to me it's, it's quite interesting the way that the, the notion of singularity is defined almost as an event when in, you know where there's going to be this sudden great big bang and all of a sudden we're going to realize that our humanity is under threat. But I would I would suggest it's actually much more of a whimper that all of these things are are, are happening right now. You know, and and so therefore that the call to action is 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 what you know what what do we do? What do we do about this? Um, yeah, I think that that's. Kind of what I was trying to um, articulate. Um, yes, um, I think you're talking in regards to singularity of a, a slow takeoff rather than a hard takeoff. So it's, it's sort of this, this slow development we're kind of in the middle of now. Um, and absolutely, but I think in regards to the, the AGI example of science fiction, that would almost be a rupture event because you'd have like a landmark case. One day there would be perhaps that court case which would then challenge um, things on that sort of that, um, legal level. Which would not be a sort of hard take off, a, a sort of rupture event in regards to the singularity itself, in regards to what you're saying very um, politically about technology, technological development. But in regards to sort of social perspective, suddenly, yes, we just have this moment where we're suddenly actually asking whether AGI should have legal rights. And I think that would be um, quite a dramatic moment, even though it's part of a long and slow development. I, I, I think you have more of an optimistic view about um, uh, kind of our, our capacity to appreciate and respond to change in an oh my god way than I do. I, I don't, I'm not positive <laughs> whatsoever. No, I, I, don't, I don't believe that that will be a, a positive outcome. That's why I was sort of articulating um, the fears and the prejudices and the, the equality issues associated. And the, the fact I was um, raising it at all is because I think it would be. Um, you know, a, a very sort of um, dystopic uh, moment. Yeah, I, I guess my question is: is how how do we record how do we recognise that this is one of those? I mean, so if we've had um, the case that you um, uh, talked about, which was Vina forty eight. I mean, why aren't we already going? Oh my God, we're here! I mean, wh why aren't we doing that? Why would we go like for Vina forty eight? Okay, she's telling us about something that happened in the past. I, I think because the, the answer is still fiction, and I think until you have that moment where B48 is top of AI to AGI, I think that would be the oh my god moment. But I, I think we're, we're, as a human species, always slightly behind the oh my god moment, and we wait till it's upon us, and then react, and it's a bit too late. Okay, yeah, so, um, uh, so, what, so what do we do? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Great, thank you. Uh, actually, uh, I'm working in case-based reasoning. Case-based reasoning is uh, like the human reasoning. For the human, uh, he can select um, cases which are or experiences which are um, very important in the future or uh, in the present or in the past. However, the machine uh, doesn't. 
uh, it can select uh, if uh, this case is uh, useful or no. So here can, comes the idea to uh, create a maintainers method that can uh, select if this case or this experience um, is useful or no, uh, related to the domain of uh, the case space, the memory of the case space or no. Uh, so uh, we have here uh, two choices. Two choices, sorry. Um, one choice is to, um, to require an expert of domain. Uh, or uh, we create uh, automatic um, method, which is our case, uh, that can select if this case or this experience uh, is very important uh, for the memory of the case space. It's like the human reasoning. So uh, before uh, the creation of this um, met method, uh, the maintenance method, we need to measure uh, the useful or the competence of the case. Uh, so, uh, so we have created a new uh, measure, which is the competence that can calculate if this case uh, is very useful for the quality of the case base or no. So we can <coughs> drop it or we can keep it. And so, essentially, how how um, broad um, broadly could that model be used? I mean, wh where do you see its applications? <laughs> the application of case-based reasoning. Yeah, yeah. Um, there is many uh, application of case-based reasoning. For example, the diagnosis of uh, medical domains, the the cars, um, the maintenance of um, of uh, many many machines. Actually, so, so is this to streamline um, databases? Are you you kind of dumping you dumping data? I mean, yeah, yeah. Uh, each case-based reasoning uh, has, um, has a database. We call it the memory. In this case, we call it the case base because it contains uh, many cases, many experiences. So, what happens to the data that gets streamlined then? Is it just deleted? Uh, no, um, small. Can uh, shrink it. Shall shrink it. Shrink. Um, what, what do you mean by that? Uh, that mean um, we keep only the cases that we uh, can need for this domain, and we drop the other. But so, not delete so all the case base. So, physically, where do they get dropped? I mean, where, where do they go? Um, Are they deleted? Yeah, deleted. Deleted. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I was just just kind of um, living in a rather paranoid world where there where there is uh, you know no um, you know deletion and uh, that everything is almost like a palimpsest of everything that you've ever done. That's no, it's, not like, into some it's not like the human di okay, <laughs> digital archaeology that's going to come back and haunt you when you're kind of like <laughs> when you don't want it to. Um, uh, Andre, um, uh, yeah. Process is memory. Why? What, what, what's the difference between memory and storage? I mean, what, why is it, what does it allow us to do? If we think about memory as process, what does it allow us to do that we're not doing with memory right uh, now? Actually, I'm not sure whether it allows us to do something, something else, something more. But uh, my point was rather that to thinking of memory as of storage. Uh, that uh, leads us into uh, great philosophical problems. So uh, for us philosophers, it would be better if we try to avoid, by any means whatsoever, <laughs> to uh, avoid, avoid this line of reasoning. Uh, so so I, I guess in, in part, my question is, what is the point of philosophy if you can't um, uh, you, you know, help translate um, your thinking into terms that make what you're thinking intelligible and um, I guess workable for, for the non-philosophers of it. Why why would why okay so philosophy wants to think about memory because they don't like the idea of storage in philosophy because it has some encumbrances with language and concepts that they're not comfortable with. So why do we care? Um, and so you know what what is the advantage of philosophers thinking about memory as process that enables us the, the rest of us to go? Well, philosophy is this really useful thing. Uh, it's really useful. Okay. Do you think so that philosophy is a useful thing? You, you, you don't think it? Uh, I'm not quite sure. Okay, uh, uh, is, 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 that what you're, is that what you're studying? <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not studying it anymore. And, okay. and uh, very often, very often I, I, I uh, think about uh, changing the job, but, but uh, <laughs> I, I think uh, philosophy can enrich uh, actually the clarity of, of, my own, uh, of my own ideas about what memory is. I'm not sure whether if I uh, if I come out of the hotel and stop someone on the street and and uh, tell them, well, what do you think memory is? 
and and if they if they if they uh, tell me memory is some kind of storage, I can I can start a discussion and try to persuade the person that memory actually uh, is rather not a storage, but uh, and I will I, I will even think that uh, that uh, I will convey some more truth to the person, but uh, the question uh, what is it good for for the person. I can't answer. Okay, uh, so, so so let me help you with the party trick. So I, I come up to you at a party and I say to you, oh, yeah, memory memory storage, and you say to me, oh, memory's process, and then I say, well, how then does this process manage to persist for so long? I mean, you know, so you, you you're, you're talking about interactions between assemblages of different ideas and concepts, uh, uh, and it hangs around for a hell of a long time. I mean, I mean, uh, how how do I get a handle on that? Uh, why do you want memory to persist somewhere? Because, well, I don't necessarily. They're memories I'd really like to delete, but they keep coming back. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't think that uh, those uh, unpleasant memories are uh, uh, somewhere. Uh, the post-traumatic stress disorder, for example. Well, that, that's that's a serious, terrible problem for you. Uh, <laughs> But uh, I don't think that the core of the problem is that, that something unpleasant is stored within you, and if you can delete it, uh, you can handle the problem. That's, that's, that's not the point. It's, it's, uh, yeah. Well, actually, you have, to, uh, you have to become able to perform your life even with this, even with this problem, and this, this can help you to work it out. Well, it's 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 not a matter of storing or deleting. Okay, okay. I think I I, I take your point. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I guess it's opening up to other people to make more general comments. Thank you. So thank you for coming to the show, and we will continue this common discussion. So this is actually a question to the entire panel because uh, in thinking about what's similar between your talks, so they all deal actually with learning, but they're dealing with learning in very different systems. It's learning in law, it's learning in the case-based reasoning, it's learning and memory. And one thing that I've been kind of bothered about is meta-learning. How to? What's the rate you should be updating whatever you're storing? Or the, the process that is kind of retrieving something, how should we treat recent versus old information if we don't want to mention the store? Uh, because it's an interesting general problem that if you update too rapidly, then the latest thing that has happened, the latest uh, political uh, scare or the latest piece of data, that tends to dominate. If you update very slowly, you can kind of average things together, but you're also going to have, for example, a system that doesn't tend to learn very rapidly. And it's also going to be behind the times quite well. So I'm kind of curious what you think. How do we, your, we figure out the optimal rate of modifying these systems? Actually, uh, mm, the case based reasoning is an incremental uh, system. That means it adds every time a new case, a new problem in the case space. So uh, automatically, the case space uh, cannot be empty at all. So uh, here, uh, the best um, time to maintain or update the case space, when a new case uh, comes to um, the memory of case space, we can here um, suggest or we can here do the update. Uh, we can choose delete it automatically or add uh, to or add sorry uh, to the case space. So the best time is when a new case space, uh, new case comes to the case space. Mm -hmm. I can follow up. I'd say that it's 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 extremely interesting for me uh, the the topic of case based reasoning because I think that that uh, uh, human uh, reasoning human, human memory is case based only to some extent uh, and. Uh, and I think that in the case of humans, you cannot determine the ideal speed of updating. 
the case base. Uh, because actually you cannot prescribe humans that they do something in their reasoning. You should do that rather than, rather than that. You can't do that actually. And uh, if uh, in, the, in the reservoir of experiences that, uh, that people must deal with uh, updates too quickly, uh, then uh, it actually ceases to be a cognitive problem and starts to be a pragmatic problem. I mean, for our parents and grandparents uh, to deal with the electronic devices, etc. It, it's actually, from a certain point, it's, uh, it's not a problem of updating the case base. It's, uh, it's, a, it's an issue of, of um, <coughs> It's an issue of uh, sustainable practice. Can I um, interpret your question as how um, quickly should we update the law? Yeah. OK. Um, well, the thinkers that I made contact with, um, such as um, Boss and Veritas um, and um, Martin um, Rothblatt, they would argue that we need to be sorting out the law for AGI now. Um, so we do not have this, um, this situation where we have the, the event without having um, thought about the, the logistics of it. Um, and they would kind of suggest that it's no good saying it's a non-event and therefore not playing for it because it, it, in their minds it, it will happen, it is inevitable, so we need to think about it now. Um, however, personally speaking, I would rather the event never happened. So. Um, the answer to your question is how quickly should we update the law? I, I wouldn't want it updated in that respect at all, but other thinkers would and say it was inevitable to happen. So I think that if you were to believe in the singularity, you would want it to be updated um, now. But, uh, but at least in a common law system, uh, when you uh, the law gets updated because you get cases dealing with it, and gradually, hopefully, it gets refined into something that works. So there is experience going into the legal system. So Martin and Barbara, proactive people, they say we should be making laws now. We don't have an experience, but we can hopefully deduce what's going to be there. Uh, your view is, yeah, it would be nice if that kind of situation didn't show up. But that's not uh, necessarily a reason not to do anything. No, about no, that. I agree. On the other hand, you might say, yeah, we're going to make up laws when uh, the singularity arrives. Well, maybe it's going to be a bit turbulent, but we're probably going to have really transhuman lawyers around that we can probably <laughs> yeah. do some really interesting court cases. Uh, yeah, absolutely. It will be an interesting thing to see. Um, but, you know, if I was idealistic, I would like to remove myself from the, the entire situation. As interesting as it would be, I'd rather it not happen. But then that's just a very subjective and personal comment to, to make. But if I was speaking in regards to my paper, in regards to what those thinkers would say, it would be that we need to be um, operating in that field now. We need to be having the, the sort of the post humanist lawyers um, now. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, there are certain things that, that are sort of saying that there'll be lots of new jobs that would arise. So you'd even have psychiatry um, for AGI um, to help them through the process, a bit like any sort of trans movement in itself. Um, so in that respect, yes. And, you know, the, the law itself does, it both um, develops very quickly and yet very slowly. I mean, the you know, civil rights movement is one example of very slow progress. But then we have moments where we have very quick decisions reached. Um, the, 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 their, their argument would be we, don't, we can't afford to have 244 years where we're trying to work out whether or not AGI should have rights because of the, the turbulent situation that you would have. Does that answer your question? Next question will be raised by Tuking. Hi. Hi. Yeah. Let me say this is actually a remark about the case based reasoning and memory. And so far as I know, that case based reasoning is, uh, in, uh, is an artificial intelligent problem solving and analysis methodology that retrieves and adopts pre previous experience to fit new contexts. Maybe I missed something, but uh, is there any mechanism in, in your model to integrate different plausible solutions for the same problem so that we can apply to a new context? Because it sounds like our memory in our daily life, right? Thank you. 
you speak about the memory of uh, the case-based reasoning, right? Or the cycle of uh, the case-based reasoning, uh, the memory. Um, actually, the memory of the case-based reasoning uh, contains many experiences, many cases with uh, uh, different fields, different domains. So here comes the idea to um, to uh, put them in uh, similar groups. Okay, like that uh, we can uh, retrieve uh, very fast uh, the solution we need uh, for uh, the new problem. So this uh, this is your question. The memory or um, because we need to retrieve the solution. Uh, you speak about the machine learning technique used. At, yeah. We can use, for example, the canner's neighbor that can, for example, select the most similar uh, cases for uh, this problem. Uh, this method actually is very um, interesting and important uh, in the retrieval step in the case-based reasoning. We can also, uh, I can suggest, for example, another technique, for example, um, the k-means. Yeah, k-means also is good uh, to, to uh, in this step. Uh, I can say in general uh, we can use and supervise uh, machine learning technique uh, in this stuff, in the memory of the case. This yeah, this is a comment regarding uh, legal rights. Um, I'd like to give you a, a, a small insight into the perspective from the uh, uh, um, animal rights uh, movement. Um, because you, you, you mentioned, um, uh, Greg Rach, you mentioned that um, you mentioned the non-human rights project. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, Stephen Wise is the, is the director of the non-human rights project. And it's, and it's a project uh, about animals. The, the objective of the project is to find, um, to establish a legal precedent that will allow us to break the barrier of the species. Uh, it doesn't talk about machines, it's talking about, in the talk uh, um, by Stephen Wise, uh, which I attended, uh, which I attended um, he, 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 he expressed a uh, very strong surprise at the fact that he was being approached by all these AI people. What are all these AI people coming and approaching me about? They're all enthusiastic about the possibility of uh, and, and, and the procedure of achieving uh, rights for artificial intelligent uh, beings. And uh, they ask me, well, you, you must have strong opinions about this. And I go, well, no, I don't, I don't have an opinion at all. I mean, if, if, if an artificial system uh, can be made that's proven to be sentient, then I'll have no problem and extending exactly the same principles as I'm saying to, as I'm proposing for, for other animals, but I just don't see that coming. <laughs> um, which, by the way, is uh, um, a response from that side to, to, to what you, uh, um, Rachel, were, were saying that uh, we are already there. Um, I and Stephen Wise don't think that we will be there for maybe even thousands of years. Uh, if at all, we will reach that point. But in a sense, we are there. If what if the, if the, what the question is is um, how do we go about extending legal rights to morally relevant subjects that uh, whose rights are not recognised at this moment? And and there, the analysis of uh, past struggles like well, the, the abolition of slavery and and uh, the civil rights uh, movement. And now with the animal rights uh, uh, and, and, and interesting projects like the non-human rights project, analyzing those cases would be very, very interesting. And uh, not just the cases, but analyzing the societal um, uh, stumbling blocks that they they, they fall upon, or all the obstacles that they that they encounter. Why why is it so difficult to make progress? Why why did it take decades, well thousands of years, but since 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 uh, the um, the, the uh, 18th century, it took decades for slavery uh, slavery to be abolished. Um, so, and, and that points to, I suppose, uh, 
all of these are things for you to comment. But, uh, uh, I, that points to, in my opinion, uh, um, the, uh, the, the the sad fact that it's not enough to establish that, be, that, 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 that it is relevant to consider legal rights for a being. Uh, but there are psychological and social aspects that uh, have been dealt with, and, it's, and it would be very interesting to see how, for example, to study how 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 did William Wilberforce, for example, achieve the abolition of slavery in Britain? How 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 did that process work? What did they do? What did they say? How did they convince people very very slowly? And uh, I, it's something that fascinates me. I'm trying to find out myself. I can't I haven't quite found out, but uh, I hope to be able. To Okay, thank you for your question. Um, in all due respect, I'd probably need a book to, to answer all the questions you posed to me. What I will try to do is very briefly make contact with um, some of the issues. Um, to, to begin with, in regards to the Non-Human Rights Project, I quoted them because they used Wesley Hoffield, and I suppose um, perhaps I should not have done that. I did that because I wanted to use him as a thinker and they summarised him rather nicely. However, um, in the, the paper that's actually in the proceedings book, I actually do make contact with the Animal, animal Rights, Non-Human Rights Project in more detail. Um, and I, I said that I couldn't, con I, I couldn't um, speak about that at all in the 20 minutes because I had to cut something. And what comes up in science fiction and um, some philosophy in regards to the difference between um, AGI rights and animal rights is the A, is the artificial part of it. And in science fiction, um, in example, the bicentennial man, that's actually raised. It's well, if we give, you know, that um, you know, in regards to the animal, um, the argument is well, um, Andrew is an artificial person, he's an artificial man. The word artificial is placed in front of it each and every time. And but I think that is the, the issue that separates the two, that the animal is in popular culture conceived as close to the natural and the AGI is conceived as close to the artificial. Whether that's true or not, that's how it's perceived. Um, so, and that's something that I expand on in the longer paper. Um, and if I had a book, I would expand on that in far more detail as well. Um, in regards to um, why it took so long um, for, the, for slavery to be abolished, um, it comes down to, as this situation does come down to, the, 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 the social the aspects of it and the cultural aspects of it and the, the, the fears associated with affording those rights and how it will have an impact on um, the, you know, the people who do have rights and wanting to protect um, for them what they believe is something that is unique and special for them and they do not want to share it. So in that respect, even though I do hesitate to draw such um, complete parallels, in that respect, it's quite a similar thing. So, I, the, that so certain thinkers would argue that the idea of not affording AGI rights would be because it's down to the similar sort of um, discrimination that um, the civil rights movement was expressing. That would be one one perspective. Um, I hope that's. Vaguely answered your question. Answer. I mean, I don't think it's, 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 um, it's, uh, it has been very well analysed. Uh, um, and um, especially what has been very well analysed is what people think about that, how they overcame that. That's the interesting question. Um, I don't know the answer to that. If I was going to guess, I would say it's a product of um, time and a product of um, dominant thought, such as governments pushing it forward. Um, but I, I think I need more time to think about that. Right. I think it's the right time to stop our discussion. So I would like to thank again to all our speakers that have been Grace Holden, Abel Smithy, Andrei, and many thanks to Rachel Armstrong. So thank you very much. And now finally I would like to ask our Movember man to close up for the conference.
Okay, so this is the end, my only friend, the end of our elaborate plans, the end. Okay, so I just prepared a couple of minutes ago a kind of chaotic presentation of some random remarks and comments that have been born in my, maybe not in my head, but somewhere else around me in the last three days. Well, so these are the things, que uh, uh, questions that I have presented here at the beginning. So I'm drawing a circle here. I have add one more thing. What can we do with crude matter? Or, and I got the feeling that we shall ask uh, if there's a natural urge to artificially create a naturally artificial entity possessing our artificially natural mind. This is, well, my, my feeling from the yesterday's talks on artificial and natural. And still I'm insisting on the, on the last question. Are the forces creating AGI different from those creating I? And I think all these are uh, pretty much related to each other, especially like the last one with the third one and the third one with the second one. And uh, yeah, I'll explain the, the first one here. Well, why, why AGI? An obvi obvious answer might be that we just try to, well, why, why do we work on AGI? Well, we can say if we want to get some money for AGI research, that this is the way how we can understand what we are. So, so this is, you know, the, 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 uh, the uh, most valuable things that human race uh, can, can do. But why? Why? Well, so I, I would say that AGI is uh, kind of psychotherapy of our mortality. That, that, yeah, I'm, I'm not saying nothing new. I'm, I'm saying that this is not, not, this is nothing new under the sun. Uh, just uh, we need, uh, again, do over and over again this uh, psychotherapy process. So, so this conference was, again, part of that psychotherapy and our contribution to that. I hope you enjoyed it. Well, usually what I realize when, when I meet usually students or people that uh, first uh, uh, that approach, uh, but people who approach the, pro, uh, the artificial intelligence field for the first time, they're simply afraid and, so, and they dismiss AI because they are afraid that the existence of AGI will dissolve uniqueness of our souls. I mean, if something like crude matter can have consciousness soul, then who are we? We are just nothing. We are just dust. And so they, I mean, they they sort of, um, in a militant way, uh, uh, assert that there uh, can be no AGI. But on the other hand, well, I always try to explain that uh, if we are gods to AGI, we are gods to ourselves. Hence, we are immortal, actually. So this is the other way. What we can, uh, this is the other way uh, that we can look at AGI. It's actually a proof of our immortality. Um, yeah, but what we can say that we will never be able to create it by good old-fashioned uh, symbolically driven AI. It's simply impossible. Um, which means by those artificial means. Uh, we have seen that this um, life or mind or the natural prolifer proliferates through crude matter when, wherever and where, wherever it gets chance. I mean, we could see it in uh, Rachel's talk where you just put some things into the dish and suddenly you get something resembling life. Not just resembling, it is probably life. It is, the, the more we observe it, the more life we get from it. And it's the same situation holds for everything we do. Whenever we arrange the world, uh, to a proper constellation, then naturality, uh, naturalness, life, mind, consciousness, or proto-consciousness starts to creep in uh, through the emergence. I mean, but don't, yeah, don't take me that seriously. Anyway, if AGI happens, we will only be fathers to to it, not not gods. So the second point 
of psychotherapy will probably not work. So we can just do some kind of backup for us or backtracking or some argumentation trick. So maybe that impossibility that is being continuously proved by our effort to, to, um, to tackle the third point. So maybe this impossibility is, is actually the real psychotherapy of us. Uh, then, uh, yeah, uh, I, I know that I'm obsessed with the problems of natural versus artificial, especially in the area of artificial intelligence, but we all are obsessed with something and something we have uh, come up somewhere around our PhD thesis we are just talking about until our death, more or less uh, in, uh, yeah. And then, uh, yeah, I, I have, uh, yeah, I have invested quite a lot into this these things well just uh, I have realized that there are many notions and many understandings of what it is natural and what it is artificial uh, last uh, or yesterday's uh, Twitter discussion with Ron showed me that he's got completely well not completely but um, uh, quite um, significantly different understanding of natural and artificial. So I just like to say that uh, I understand natural in terms of Greek physis. It means, you know, roots, rotting, mud, cancer, you know, all those things that happen to you when you die, when the nature, the physis takes you back. On the other hand, on the, on the opposite side, you've got charybdis of logos. It means something crystal clear, words, logic, clarity, but also emptiness, you know, dementia as opposed to cancer, which means uncontrolled disappearance of things. Because so when, when, you, when you've got unlimited uh, senses, you just end up staring into nothingness because there would be no emergence showing you new shapes, new objects in the world. And life, not only human life, is, is about steering between this, this Scylla and Charybdis. And maybe our consciousness, here consciousness in Danet's, Danet's meaning, is the steersman. And yeah, I would say that human mind or human consciousness is the best steersman here. And uh, once we, uh, yeah, uh, the, the, the thing about uh, natural objects is that whenever some, some part of the world gets its objectivity, it means we start to call it an object, it, this, the, this the right, the right in this moment, it starts to be drawn by Charybdis of Logos. Just saying this is an object is something where we start to steal naturalness of that thing and human mind, the human consciousness is the best expert in staying right between these two realms. So yeah, and, and since uh, steersmanship is art, everyone knows that. Then also life is art and AGI too. <laughs> Thank you for coming here. Have a safe journey back. Okay, <laughs> that's it. And just the organizational thing. This is the place where we are going at 7.30. Uh, I made a reservation there for about 15 people. The address is, is here. The, the name of the pub is Stara Sladovna. This is the address. The street, Mala, Miss Lipo. The street, we are... <laughs> we are somewhere... I don't know. So somewhere here, right? Okay. Yeah, somewhere here. We're here. Yeah, you're here. So it's right here. With the big, big, big road. Yeah, you can see. It's really, really road. Okay, so we'll be there at 7.30, or I'd like to ask some of you to be there at 7.30, because I think I'm not going to be there at 7.30. I'll come later. And it's going to be in the second floor, and the reservation is made on my uh, last name, so find it out somewhere, <laughs> try to pronounce it before you go there, or just say that you're from the conference, they might know. 
Okay, so those of you who are coming there, see you later, and uh, those of you who are not coming there, see you later. Thank you. <laughs>